Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Autistic Tidbits and Tangents podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Kara Diamond. I'm an autistic teacher, university lecturer, author, all sorts of things from Toronto, Canada. And I'm Maya Todiel. I'm an autistic and ADHD psychologist, uh, author, speaker, whatnot, all the things. Um, and today we are joined by Michaela Barb. And Kara, you have the bio ready. Uh, So Michaela is a fitness and habit coach that empowers individuals to build consistent habits in fitness, nutrition, and daily life. After getting diagnosed with ADHD late in life, she's worked to adapt typical fitness strategies and advice to be more accessible for other neurodiverse individuals. Her approach focuses on releasing guilt, embracing flexibility, and building practical systems for lasting change. Oh, I'm so excited because I need all of those things, Michaela. So, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So, that's what yeah, we're going to so, be talking about today. Yeah, that's the topic. And my God, it's it's going to be like it's going to be so interesting, but it's also so much and so complex. So, I'm really looking forward to this because you know, fitness and well being is kind of where everything collides. So, let's get into it. All right. Music. <laughs> Welcome to Autistic Tidbits and Tangents. Candid conversations between autistic off-hour professionals. With lots of tangents in different accents. <laughs> Trigger warnings for this episode include body image, body dysmorphia, fat phobia, internalized ableism, kind of ableism in general. Um, This episode, we're talking about all things to do with the body and exercise. So just keep that in mind and let's go. All right. So, um, Michaela Barr, I'm so glad to have you here. I, I, kind of just came across one of your posts on threads um, about ADHD and exercise and how kind of like the way that the way that other people address motivation and exercise and like getting into habits just does not work for a lot of neurodivergent people. Nope. And I just remember thinking, I need to talk to you. <laughs> And uh, so then I sent your post to Kara and she did all of that stuff um, because I was, I'm scatterbrained. So, and now you're here, which is really awesome. It so happened. Happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm glad my threads found its way to my people. <laughs> yeah. Um, now that particular thread was all about how, you know, some of the typical fitness advice that is given often doesn't work for neurodivergent folks. Um, Yeah, like motivation, I think, was something that you were talking about. Do you want to just tell us a little bit more about that? (laughs) Yeah, so that particular post, um, I talk about this a lot, actually, because so many people um, that are neurodiverse are told that if you really want it, you'll do it. And so they kind of get this mindset of like, I, I mean, I do want to do it, but mm-hmm. I can't do it. And mm-hmm. so now they're like, well, maybe I don't want it bad enough. Yeah. So oh. it's it's so hard to contend with that kind of mindset. And in the fitness space, even when I was studying, like the books I studied to become a personal trainer, there was one specific part on motivation and it said like word for word, it said external motivation, things like having a pump up playlist are not sustainable and that you need to be able to encourage internal motivation, like remembering your why or why something is important to you, because that's the thing that's going to lead to sustainability. And it's so wrong (laughs) for someone that is neurodivergent because Internal motivation does not always provoke action. Yes. And so someone will be sitting there going, man, I really want to, I like, I really like, I want to do this. I need to do this, but it's not enough. And so yeah. now they think 
that they just don't have either the motivation or the um, uh, discipline yeah. to get it done when oh. it's, it's totally the opposite things that like our external factors are the things that are going to get us there. Those are the things that are sustainable for us. Exactly. Oh, I, I, I love, love that sentence. so much. <laughs> I love the sentence. Internal motivation doesn't provoke action or it doesn't promote action mm-hmm. for us. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. That's a brilliant way of phrasing it because it's like, we don't have the the dopamine circuits in our brain that will make us actually get off our asses and do it. We yeah. have the, like, I want to do the things, but I'm, yeah. I'm in a state of inertia. Yeah. And, and actually the, the exact thing that, that you mentioned, which is like the, having a playlist, um, the only way that I can get myself to exercise is dancing. Mm-hmm. And like, I have, I'm really, really, really privileged in that I have a room in my house dedicated to dancing. <laughs> yeah, dancing. <laughs> so like I have a room where I go in there and I put on some loud music and then I <laughs> dance and that's my exercise. Um, yeah. Like if I don't have music, it won't get done. It absolutely will not get done. And I think it's because music introduces that dopamine Mm -hmm. that I'm lacking. And then like the endorphins and whatnot keep me going. Mm -hmm. But we do need that initial push Mm -hmm. to actually get started. And we need that consistently because we don't build habits the way that other people do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I I made another post. I don't it might have been the same one honestly, I can't remember. But um I was talking about how sometimes things that are considered sustainable for neurotypicals simply don't work for us, but the things that are often seen by neurotypicals as um silly or like not effective those are the tools that we need to be using but they're put down so much because uh, they don't work for other people and so we just don't have the tools necessary the strategies necessary or really the mindset around it is what it is mostly mostly it's the mindset and just the the culture of fitness in general that really doesn't like lend itself to being neurodivergent friendly mm-hmm. And so what strategies do do like neurotypicals consider silly or ineffective? We've talked um, about playlists, but yeah, so playlists mm-hmm. or um like reward systems and I do a lot I, I really struggle with like the transition aspect yes. of it. Like I know that I once I get there. I'm going to have a blast. I'm going to love it. I'm going to feel good. Um, Oh, that's another good one where they'll say, um, instead of focusing on how you feel right now, this is a strategy often taught by neurotypicals is that you should focus on how the future you is going to feel. I don't care about her. No, (laughs) that person does not exist. Okay. So I need to deal with how I'm feeling right now. Like I, I need to wake up because I work out in the morning. So I need yeah. to wake up and have a period of time where all I can do is just complain that I'm awake. Yeah. Like I, I need to have time where I'm like, this is horrible and I hate it. Yeah. And then I'm going to be like, okay, now I can go where yeah. that's not the mindset that is taught yeah. by other people. You know, no, you're, you're like, kind of taught up. to like push yeah. that away. Yeah. Put on your exercise clothing and go out for a run. Oh right. God. Like I'm funny, running. I can't even awesome. get dressed right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And the no. thing too is like, sorry, no, you go ahead. No, 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 you're, you're up. No, I was just going to say that people always talk about discipline, right? And you mm-hmm. see all these posts and people talking about like, oh, well, I didn't feel like working out, but I did it anyway. And you need to use discipline because you can't mm-hmm. rely on motivation. That's fantastic. But so many of us struggle to do things that we enjoy. Yes. That if that if it's something we don't enjoy and you're expecting us to now force ourselves to do it, like it's not going to happen. I cannot force myself to go and do this. It's mm-hmm. not going to be a thing. 
Well, it, we have such a huge, like, it's so, it's such a pervasive myth in society that links willpower to, um, you know, like morals where, uh, you know, you're not a good enough person if you don't have willpower. And it's like, it should not be linked at all. Like we have difficulty forming habits, getting started on things. And it's not because we don't want to do well. It's just, it's hard for our brains. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know, every day, even though I, I, you know, I love having good oral hygiene and it matters to me a lot. I have to talk myself into brushing my teeth every single time. It's never automatic. It's never uh, something I don't have to think about or actively convince myself to do. And mm-hmm. that's just so much energy, so much more energy spent just trying to do the the minutia of everyday life, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that brings up another aspect as well, which is the sensory part, mm-hmm. right? So, mm-hmm. Kara, when you mentioned t- toothbrushing, um, I'm like, one of my big, 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 big issues with, with brushing my teeth is the taste of, of toothpaste. Oh, gotcha. Like, it took me so long to find a brand and a particular flavor of that brand that I hate a little bit less. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that when it comes to exercise, there's, there's so much sensory processing involved in that but there's okay so first of all the the whole like motor skills issue is a thing but then when you add like having to get ready having to put up with how it feels to sweat having to put up with how pain feels by the way Mm -hmm. and then you have to hit the shower afterwards which is not a one-step task so many executive function tasks built in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a huge list, showering. Mm-hmm. Getting yeah, ready to go I'm to the gym. You, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because I, um, I've i talked about this before, too, is that, that that's another thing that is like not even in the minds of someone that doesn't deal with executive dysfunctioning, is that I, I don't like the way my clothes feel. Like I have to wear a very specific brand of clothing to get myself to work out. I also need to work out in a very specific temperature. Otherwise, yes. I'm not going to do it. So there, I had a client actually who, because most of my clients are online clients. And so I'll have them send me um, form videos of themselves if they have weightlifting protocol. So I can just check to make sure that they're they're you know not going to hurt themselves. And I noticed that this client was breaking her form to pull on her shirt. Mm -hmm. And so I asked about it. I was like, what's, what's going on here? You know, like you're breaking your form a little bit. Is your shirt uncomfortable? And she was like, I know that this sounds dumb, but like, it's, it's so distracting. I, Mm -hmm. this is so uncomfortable. I said, okay, well, if you don't have another shirt, We'll just change the exercise. Like it was not worth it to continue doing that exercise because she was breaking form and like mm-hmm. breaking form is dangerous. So I'm yeah. not going to sit there and tell you, oh, just ignore it. Like just Power through yeah. program a different. It's it's so easy for me as your coach to be able to just change that. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's so important to have someone that really understands because she didn't bring that up. I'm the one that noticed it, you know, yeah. so it's so important to have people that understand how our brains work because they'll pick up on stuff that maybe you don't even realize is happening. Like she didn't realize she was breaking form. Yeah. Well, first of all, because she sent it in. No, go ahead. First of all that, but, but a lot of neurodivergent people also don't actually realize that their sensory processing differences are sensory processing differences. Like they think everybody feels like that. Yeah. So she might mm-hmm. be like, yeah, my, my shirt is super uncomfortable, but like, isn't everyone's like, <laughs> isn't it just me that doesn't know how to cope with it? Like maybe I'm just weak. Right. Yeah. And, and a lot of us are trained to feel that way because <laughs> a lot of other people are like, yeah, well, everyone's a little autistic or everyone's a little weird, like whatever, like, yeah, sunlight is bright for everyone. Yeah. But it hurts me. Right. You know? And like, yeah, some people don't like what it feels like to sweat or some people um, might be able to feel like their joints moving more than other mm-hmm. people. 
And like, there's a lot of different ways that you can have sensory processing differences, but no one tells you what your sensory processing differences are. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to discover? Yeah. Yeah. It's just not, it's not talked about. It's not brought up at all. And unfortunately, whenever I talk to people about it, they're, they're even hesitant to talk about it because they feel like they've been trained to feel like it, it shouldn't bother them. Like it's, it's, I should just push through it. Mm -hmm. Definitely internalized shame, internalized ableism, like what we should be able to do. Yeah. And instead of listening to our, our bodies and our own experiences and uh, we we need coaches like you <laughs> to help we do. we do can you can you make an academy to train <laughs> other neurodivergent fitness coaches like, that would be so need, cool we need an army of of coaches that get it yeah. yeah yeah we really do we do and it's it's if we just started talking about more of these things without that shame mm-hmm. i think it would trigger a lot of yeah. action you know because Absolutely. it's just there's not enough conversation no Um, tangent personal experience that Mm -hmm. will come to a point i hope uh so um several years ago um before i unfortunately injured my foot so i haven't been able to go back i i got really into kickboxing um i loved it i just i found like it stopped the brain chatter i was very present in a way that i'm not most of the time um and it, like, it was tough to go. There were parts of it, parts of like the workout routine that were like, I, like I knew there was going to be like the 15 minutes of hell that is the warm up, but I was going to get through those 15 minutes. And mm-hmm. there was always enough variability and change in, in what happened in that 15 minutes that it stayed interesting to me. Um, but uh, as I gradually increased going, one of the things that helped me was I think someone said this to me or I realized it, but I I realized not every class has to be a hundred percent. I can go and do 60%. I, you -hmm. know, like half-assing a class is, is, is okay. It's better than nothing, you know, like that's okay. And that was really freeing to realize every Mm -hmm. time I don't have to be giving my entire, like the rest of the energy that I have for the day, the rest of my spoons. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, What are, what are other things like that help neurodivergent folks like us figure out and, and make those habits or make choices that don't feel so burdensome? Well, a lot of what I help my clients through is mindset, mindset around themselves, mindset around exercise, making things more general, something that we really struggle with and something I've struggled with a lot in the past is that you feel like you have to be doing something specific in order for it to count. So like you were saying, I have to give a hundred percent or I have to do weightlifting. Like I can't do anything else. If I want to build muscle, I have to do weightlifting. So if there's ever a day when you're like, I cannot, I can't, I'm so yeah. low on energy today. Like it's just not happening. Something I do with my clients and something I do in my own life is making different versions of the same thing. So kickboxing actually is a really great example because I, for um, two and a half years, actually taught um, a martial art called the way. And then I did like jujitsu and I did MMA. So like, it's just really funny. Like I, everyone that I've talked to that has ADHD, we're always drawn to kickboxing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there's just a lot going on and it's and it's it's variable like you said like yeah. that's why I think we're drawn to it is because it's yeah. it's not the same thing every single time and there's like yeah. e- progression that's immediate um yes. but anyway making different versions of the same thing is something that I really help my clients with because we're not going to have the same energy all of the time we're not going to have the same you know, like the weather, I, I get really, really low energy when it's raining outside. So I, it's going to be harder for me to be able to pick myself and go out to the gym. Mm-hmm. So I have stuff that I can do at home. Yeah. Or like, if you wanted to build strength, you don't, and you hate weightlifting because a lot of people, it it is boring. It is boring. Yes. So something that I recommend for those people is, well, can we do, um, like rock climbing instead you're still that's so good for you and so 
good to build muscle. So just kind of breaking free of those rules that we make for ourselves is something that really helps because the less rules that we, I mean, we still need structure, but the less like hard rules that we set for ourselves, the easier it's going to be to find and make those adjustments based on what we need for that day. Yeah. And there's no like set. So it's more like guidelines. Yeah. We need guidelines. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, that always makes me think of, Mm -hmm. sorry. I was just going to, that just reminded me of a quote from a movie. (laughs) Say it, say it. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it is. I, I have that in my head a lot, actually. <laughs> but I know, every applies, time someone asks. But it applies to so much about, um, like, health. Every, every way that you can approach health, the way that we've been taught to think about it, I think, is just too boxed. Mm-hmm. Like... Too normative. There's only yeah. actually, yeah, we, we need actually that revolution of it's just guidelines guys. Yeah. Um, I've, I've actually, okay. So tangent, but kind of relevant, I guess. <laughs> um, no, I, I mentioned, um, I mentioned to Michaela just before we started, I have a one-year-old and, and that's, um, that's a wild ride to be on. But one of the issues with having a baby is, all of the health and safety recommendations that go along with babies, like how are they supposed to sleep? How are they supposed to eat? How are they supposed to like, everything has like a huge long list of like, you should be doing this in exactly this way. And la 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 la. Like, and it's too much. No one can do it. No one can do it perfectly. So um, at one point, my husband (laughs) finds an interview with uh one of the like he- like head people from uh the danish um health ministry uh mm-hmm. that that sets these guidelines for our country and and where they've they've asked this question this particular question with like well how do you expect everyone to do all of these things and this person is like well we we don't we don't, no one can, it's completely impossible. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, they're, they're all written down as like hard and fast rules or else your baby's going to die. Right. Um, and, and he's like, well, on honestly, like do whatever you can. But like, if I, if I could choose just one thing off the top of this entire list that is more important than everything else, it's D drops, which is like a, a vitamin D supplement oh. um, that I don't know what it is in other countries, but I mean, Denmark is a very, very dark country. So D vitamin supplements are like in Canada too. So kind of important. <laughs> um, and he's like, that, that's the one that's the top of the list right there. So like <laughs> everything else is just try. Well, that's so <laughs> hard think, for us. Cause we, we do yeah. tend to, literal and think okay this is what I'm supposed to be doing and we hold ourselves to impossible standards and I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people do in a lot of aspects of life and I think we actually need this revolution of it's just guidelines do what you can and we need it when it comes to exercise we need it when it comes to food we need it when it comes to social media um like everything that's influencing our mental and physical health we kind of need those guidelines of everything counts you know you don't have to go out on a two-hour hike every day a five-minute walk is better than nothing right Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i that's so hard too for um a lot of us, because like when we start something, we start it. Like we're in it. <laughs> we 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 are in it. We are doing all the things, yeah. and it's at that point where we kind of lose that steam a little bit that we start to struggle because yeah. now I can't follow the rules. Mm-hmm. Now all the things that I was doing, now they feel impossible. And I kind of think of it as like 
a two lane highway, you know, where there, there's a fast lane and there's a slow lane. And whenever you start something, a new interest or whatever, you're in that fast lane. Okay. You're making a lot of progress. You're building all the skills. You are getting there. And then somewhere along the way, like you just start to slow down. So you have to switch lanes into that slow lane. And yeah. have you ever like been driving behind someone that is going super slow and like now everyone behind you is passing you and you just can't make it back into that other lane to pass them. That's Mm -hmm. what it feels like. Like you're looking for that opportunity to get back into that fast lane and spark that drive again, but you can't, you're stuck. And that is why so many of us struggle. You know, we see that we're not moving as fast as we used to be or as easily as we were before. And we have no idea how to get that back. But the key is never really to get that back. It's Mm -hmm. now we have to figure out how to move in the slow lane, right? Now, what's important to us now? Because there's going to be a lot of times where, again, this is actually one of the reasons why I stopped offering um, three-month coaching packages because those first three months, you're on it. You're good. Like everything, you don't even need me, honestly. It's after that. What happens after when we slow down? Yeah. How are we going to keep going? And it's never about trying to make it back into that fast lane or like spark that same drive again. It's just what's most important to me and how can I implement that? And what are the adjustments that I need to make? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also getting out of the mindset that I have to see progress every month or mm-hmm. every week or every whatever, because we are so prone to needing to measure our progress instead of, you know, just being in it and then looking back like, oh, three months ago, this was harder and yeah. now it's actually easier. That's weird. How did that happen? No, we need, we need that feedback as it's happening. We need to measure that progress and get that reward. And so it's, it's hard to, it's hard to stick to it when you don't get that feedback. And the thing is just with exercise and with diet changes and all of that, most of the like obvious results happen somewhat quickly, especially Mm -hmm. if, if you're on a weight loss journey and, and you've got a lot of weight to lose the first couple of pounds drop off pretty quick. But the last 10 really don't. Yeah. Well, okay. I got like three thoughts. I'm just going to say them all. <laughs> so yep. first thing I'm thinking. The of first that, thing is skinny ladies stop talking about weight loss. Yeah, I was like, I'm not going to engage on this topic. You know, that's, that's never one of my goals. Like, uh, you know, I've got oh. a metabolic syndrome. I'm like, I'm, I'm never going to lose substantial amounts of weight. So, but working out is more about mobility and feeling good mm-hmm. and all of yeah. the side benefits that we get. But variability is so important to me. I'm like, I was just thinking I need to make like a wheel of fortune wheel or something with different forms of exercise and movement. And just like, that would really work for me. And then the second thing that I was thinking, again, going back to variability um, and rock climbing, which you mentioned before, one of the reasons I, I do enjoy rock climbing is like you, you get rewarded. You get little dopamine boosts every time you figure out where you're, how to move up a little mm-hmm. bit. You don't have to necessarily get all the way the, to the top for it to be fulfilling. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a lot of like fun strategy stuff going on in your brain. So like, that's a great one. What was the third thing I was going to say? I don't know. Oh, process versus um, like process goals versus result oriented goals. I know you've written about this. I read this cool research article about surgeons who do better when they have process oriented versus results oriented. So yeah, like, okay, you you can probably explain it way better. But like, what's the difference between like a process oriented versus a results oriented goal? So it's so funny that you bring that up. Um, that's one of the first things I always work with my clients about because they people come to me, obviously they have an outcome that they're trying to reach, right? Like there, there is some goal that they want to hit, which is fantastic. I think that's great. I think you should set goals. However, just like we were talking about, it's going to be really hard for us to sustain that interest in that goal, depending on how far away it is, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're either not going to see it for a long time, or we're going to see it pretty quickly. And then now, now what? 
right? So what happens when we reach that goal? The habits fall because the goal, we've done it. It's it's over, right? Yeah. So focusing on those process goals, the process goals are the steps that you take to reach the outcome. So an example of um, an outcome or a result uh, goal versus process goals would be, let's say I want to, I want to be able to do a pull up, non-assisted, just me. I want to be able to do that. Right. So mm-hmm. instead of focusing on that goal, I'm going to say, okay, to reach that goal, I'm going to work. I'm going to do my back workout twice a week. Mm-hmm. That's a process goal. Cause now I can say, okay, check, did it. Yeah. And now I know it's it's easier for me to see my progress that way too, because I know these are the steps that I need to take. And mm-hmm. I also know that whenever I hit that goal, I'm still going to be focusing on that process. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've had this happen in my own personal life where I've been really interested in losing weight. And then on that journey, you know, you start to appreciate the things that your body can do. Or um, like I had a baby and I was just like, wow, my body is incredible. I can't (laughs) believe that I ever thought that it wasn't. And so through that process, like I gradually just kind of stopped caring about that weight loss because now it was about how can I take care of my body? How can I show my appreciation for my body? But because I stopped caring about that goal. All of my habits fell. So if I would have been focused on the process and the habit itself, that Mm -hmm. would have carried me, which is a change that I've made now. And I mean, I'm good now, but you know, this is just something that I see a lot where people are too focused on the outcome and it's either too far away or comes too quickly. It's very delicate balance. (laughs) That's fascinating. Um, I, yeah, that actually, that actually makes me kind of want to talk about body image and yes. and social media. So a lot of people, especially men, I feel when they start working out, um, they might be listening to these like social media fitness coaches, or they might be seeing images of bodybuilders, or you know, even in movies, um, these like completely unhealthy and unrealistic and frankly for many people unattainable um bodies shapes like you you're just you're not supposed to get there that's not normal and mm-hmm. it's um you know uh i i remember i remember listening to interviews with um Hugh Jackman and Henry Cavill about their shirtless scenes and they talk yeah. about the dehydration process leading up to those scenes and i i think a lot of young people especially don't know how unhealthy those body standards are but it's still their goal when they start mm-hmm. and i just think that must be so hard for people to deal with because how do you how do you even start exercising or how do you keep going and get a healthy um, a healthy process in mind when this is being thrown in your face all the time and you're being told this is what you're supposed to look like. And for women, yeah. usually it's be skinny, but have big boobs and a big butt also right. at the same Sweet time. Cartoon it's, character. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> got <them>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. I mean, and being in the fitness space, being a coach, I'm around a lot of other coaches and it, it's exhausting. It's so terrible, especially when like, I know none of my coach friends, but I know other coaches that will post photos, but they never post them unposed. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of things that you can do in a picture without necessarily having to edit it to adjust the way that your body looks. And it's, it's um it's unfortunate because so many people, like you said, they're just not aware of it. Like um yeah. when I was doing martial arts, we were a combat gym. So we we had people like go out and compete yeah. and to make their weight, because you know they have to do that like weigh in before the fight. Yeah. To make their weight, we have them running laps in 90 degree heat oh. with 
in in one of those like suits like those yeah. that look like aluminum foil that like keeps oh, everything on, in no. which sounds like the worst thing in the world <laughs> and like and he torture. would run around it was and he would wear one of those things that like um made it harder to breathe too like the atmosphere ones wow so so he's doing all this right and he steps up on the scale and he looks great but what did he have to do to get there yeah. so yeah, people well, think like- that it's sorry, it, it, but it actually also impacts um, the usefulness of the muscle mass that you've got. Like muscles that look good aren't necessarily the ones that are useful. Um, and it, so I, I have this I have this thing a lot because um, ah, I, I, I don't want to get too much into it, but like my husband is a big guy. Big guy, bear. And um, he's also definitely overweight. He struggled with that throughout his entire adult life. But he's barrel shaped. And barrel shaped men can lift. And so there's a lot of guys that will look at a guy like that and think, He's fat. Mm -hmm. And then they'll look at a skinny guy with a lot of very defined muscle and they'll be like, whoa, that guy can lift like that guy's strong. And no, because useful muscles don't necessarily look good. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's that's one of the issues for me with the social media um, body image focus rather than health focus and usefulness focus where it's like do those muscles actually actually do anything for you do they benefit you yeah i yeah the functionality exactly (laughs) yeah yeah that that's the word that had slipped my brain sorry (laughs) i realize this is a podcast and most people just like listen but i kept giggling to myself at times that you were talking about um like anytime just sort of like bigger bodies have come up. I I was giggling to myself because just, just like just before this podcast, my, uh, my partner and I were, we're like hugging each other. We both have a tummy. We both definitely have a tummy and we sort of just like sumo wrestler, like bounced our tummies off each other. And it was so sensorily wonderful, but that was playing through my mind. It's like bigger bodies. You know, we really have to get rid of like the stigma and people thinking just like you said, Maya, like, how a body looks is representative entirely of its health. Um, you know? Yeah. And it, and it just yeah. isn't, but also, also can I just in, interject here? Like yeah. bear hugs are the best, the greatest big, big guys. And yeah. like, Oh, the, yeah, hugs, the hugs are just awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. So many people, um, you know, you see someone and you kind of just make judgments about their capabilities, but you have absolutely no idea what that person is capable of. Yeah. It, like if you take you by contrast, my husband has always been very skinny. And this is something that he actually struggled with because he did, he got made fun of for it. Right. Like yeah. he didn't like to be that. So he mm-hmm. like worked on it for a little bit. But the thing is, is that he's insanely strong. Like mm-hmm. every time he does anything, I'm always it's surprising even to me and I see it every day because he's so strong. You have absolutely no idea what someone is capable of just by looking at them. No. Yeah. But all of the, like, yeah, it can make it really difficult to go into a gym. Like as someone who's bigger body, like, you know, I'm actually pretty, pretty comfortable in my own skin, but like, you know, uh, I could see that being a really intimidating thing um, going in and having people maybe making assumptions about someone's fitness level um, or health level when like diet and exercise is not the answer. Cause I mean, not that it's not an answer. It's de- they're definitely important things to do, but many people have bigger bodies because of medical conditions, because of like the medicines we're on because, of, you know, it, that's such a simple, overly simplistic answer. Um, that always gets me mad too. When I see it, like on social media, people being like, they should just diet and exercise. Ah, uh, you know that. Well, wish I would have honestly, thought of that. Yeah, honestly, exactly. Sometimes I can't help thinking like, 
people assume that I'm pretty healthy because I'm <laughs> lean. <laughs> and you, 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 you used to eat like a chocolate bar every day. Remember? And I was like, oh I'm my a God. sugar addict. <laughs> I'm a complete sugar addict. And <laughs> like, no, I, I, I definitely, up until my feet broke, I was, I was probably better. Um, so Michaela, you won't know this about me, but in, in my like early to mid twenties, my feet started cramping like constantly. And we're talking like hour long cramps. And I also developed, um, um, kind of like tendonitis in my feet Mm. and I couldn't walk for about a year. And since then, like I've gotten back to a point where I can probably walk for about half an hour in a day without having consequences the next day. Yeah. But otherwise like the pain just starts building and I'm walking on fire. Um, so like for me getting a fitness level is like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm just going to dance cause I can put up with the pain through that. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and that, that's it. That's it. But like, People assume I'm pretty fit because I'm skinny, but I'm not. There was a really interesting study. So I'm a huge nerd, Michaela, but there was a a really interesting study. I forget how many years ago, but what they did was they looked at um, gut bacteria and they Mm. put um, they put groups of people on basically the same diet, the same exercise plan. And the, the people who were already skinny like stayed skinny, lost weight. The people who were already obese, overweight, like it, it, like it didn't matter the diet and the exercise. It yeah. was more about gut bacteria, which I thought was really fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, then, and that's one of the reasons why like on, on my pages and stuff, you, you're not ever going to see me post like a weight win or a body win or like yeah. before and after pictures. I that's, I don't do that most of the before and afters that I care about are intangible. Mm -hmm. So someone's relationship with food, someone's relationship with their body, someone's relationship with their mind. Like that's what I care about. So that's what I post. Mm -hmm. I think it's misleading when all you're doing is posting before and after pictures. And I'm not saying you can't like, obviously you're clap, you're proud of your clients and like, I want to celebrate people's wins. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, but but the stuff there's that enough people for that. that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not yeah. going to be like, you look so hot. I'm going to be like, you look like you feel great. You know? Yeah. yeah. Good for you. Yes. <laughs> That's it. You're happy. You look, yeah. you know, proud of yourself. But mm-hmm. it, it's exactly what you said, Michaela, because it's, it's how you feel about what you've accomplished that matters. It's, it's not what you can see. Mm-hmm. It's not the number on the scale or the muscle definition or like, no, no, no. It's now I can do that pull up or I can do that stretch that I've never been able to do. And it feels really good because now my body can do something new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like. And the the benefit that the benefit that comes from like whatever, whatever length your workout is seven minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour, like having that time where maybe you're forgetting about all your stresses at home, at work at, you know, you have that time and the benefits of that, the trickle down effect of Mm -hmm. carving out time just to pay attention to your body. Mm -hmm. Um, and it like to let things go in your mind. Like I I could not believe the difference in my mood overall when I, when I had a more active lifestyle still trying to get back there a little bit but like that's a really remarkable thing and that's what helps sustain you a little bit too when you realize wow I overall I'm finding things easier to manage I'm not holding on to things I'm better at handling conflict like because Mm -hmm. I have these moments of peace and Mm -hmm. so it's like how do we make choices that bring us peace and yeah work on our bodies (laughs) Yeah. And that's something that I do with my clients too, is like, aside from the process goals, even because sometimes that's not even enough to provoke the action. Right. So Mm -hmm. I always tell my clients, I'm like, you know what? Yeah. Overall, there's going to be some benefits long-term. What's this doing for you today? Mm -hmm. Let's focus on that. What, how are you going to feel immediately when it starts? Not when it's over. How does it feel when it starts? What, 
what do you want out of this? And I like, maybe it, it doesn't have to be serious. Like everyone tries to make this so overcomplicated, but I've gone and worked out simply because I wanted to listen to a podcast that wasn't kid friendly. And I have a three-year-old with me all day. So I'm like, you know what? This is the only time I get to listen to this podcast. <laughs> so I'm going to go just for this podcast. Like and, and everyone tries to make it so deep and so, you know, like involved and it, it really doesn't have to be that way. That is why so many people struggle with sustainability because they're trying to make everything so intense. I'm like, this is just a daily life. Like it's not that serious. Yeah. We can calm down. It's fine. <laughs> I love that. It's like low pressure, low demand, which is exactly what we need, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so this makes me think of two things, which is one, when you get a fitness coach um, or a health coach of any kind, Um, there's one major thing that is going to be the same issue that it is in therapy, which is the match between the coach and the client. Yeah. Like you, you don't need to find a fitness coach that meets these criteria. You need to find a fitness coach that motivates you, that knows how to motivate you. There needs to be that match. And I would say who also accepts your limits. Like, so I, but that's a part of being a match. Like I have a dear friend trying to push your client out of what is achievable. I have Mm -hmm. a dear friend who's, who is loving working with um, like a fitness coach. Um, But the fitness coach every once in a while will say, uh, you know, add this to what you're doing, add this, add this. And she's like, no, I'm at my max. Like I, you know, I'm good with, with this right now. Like, um, I think sometimes as neurodivergent people, when we see it as like, oh my gosh, now I'm constantly having to add uh, extra things. And it, it just feels like eventually there's going to be this tipping point where you can't do it anymore. Yeah. Uh, if that makes sense, it just seems so yeah. overwhelming in the long term. You mean every day yeah. I need to drink eight to 10 glasses of water and I have to do this and I have to do that. And we can give up just based on like the totality of the picture. Yeah. 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 Um, And and then the other thing that I thought of when you were talking is body doubling, Mm -hmm. which is, I think, a part of why even having a fitness coach or a personal trainer, why that works for people who usually it's, it's autism and ADHD, but like neurodivergence in general, having someone there having someone who talks to you about this and motivates you in this particular area of your life Mm -hmm. can really be key to keep the drive going. Yeah. Because otherwise, as you said earlier, you know, we lose that motivation after those first three months and it's like, yeah, what now? I can't, I can't anymore. And just having, like, I do this with Kara sometimes we actually, uh, we will log on and just do work. office work like because we both write books and it is oh. lonely sometimes yeah. writing books. So just like it's, having a virtual office to show up in, body doubling, it works. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking that it, it must be the same thing for exercise. But then there's the extra part of me um, that is like, what about the... Um, the problem between body doubling and body dysmorphia, like being seen. Yes. Cause like for, for me showing up at a gym is a huge problem. I cannot go to a gym because if I feel like somebody's looking at me, yeah. I can't do it. Mm-hmm. Totally. And like, yeah. I would probably be fine with being alone with a coach but if there's anybody else there, I'm like, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's why I think a lot of people really like the online coaching like mm-hmm. model because they yeah. get that accountability, but they don't necessarily, they still have flexibility in how they show up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like I have clients that don't feel comfortable sending in progress pictures. I'm not going to require them to do that. There's mm-hmm. other things that we can focus on that denotes progress, right? That's not yeah. all it's about. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, like they, they have access to me all day, every day. It's not like we meet once a week and 
then the rest of the week you're on your own. Like if you're struggling with something or you, you need a body double, like tell me, I, yeah. I will be there for you. I'll message you. Like we can do whatever. Yeah. And the other thing about having a coach too, is like, it kind of gives you more flexibility in a way, because now you don't have to think about what to do when yes. one thing stops being interesting. Like if you started weightlifting and now you're not interested in it, what do I do now? Well, your coach can just write you a different program, you know? Yeah. So it, it takes that like mental burden of like having to figure it out how, yeah. because someone's already doing it for you. That's yeah. exactly what my friend said, actually, what was, you know, oh, yeah. now it, it's taken off a huge amount of like the executive functioning required just to know uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with my trainer and they're going to tell me what to do and how to use the machine. So I don't have to be stressed out about looking foolish or not knowing what to do. Like the decision fatigue is gone. <laughs> Mm -hmm. because of that the mental load of exercise is gone yeah um, <laughs> I also think like we need to find ways to make exercise feel fun like dopamine is huge for us I, I remember like 10 years ago I just found the Facebook post I uh I put on a Richard Simmons workout video but I like dressed up in like spandex and a side pony and like 80s and it was the most I laughed so much I got abs you know what I mean like it was so much fun <laughs> and we need to like have those options too so that it we remember it's supposed to also feel good it doesn't always have to be awful <laughs> yeah yeah and I give my clients like we call them wild card workouts oh, where love. they'll have um they'll have a program set yeah. Um, but then I'll have other options that they can replace it with. And mm -hmm. if they don't feel like doing the one that's programmed, they have another option. Right. So it's important to keep that variability or like stuff that, that you're interested in because that's what motivates us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So actually, actually watching my baby move around has made me think like, Wow the way society works now for bodies for for adult bodies is just mad because like my daughter weighs about a sixth of what i do but the the percentage of her own body weight that she can lift and carry around because it's fun um is massive compared to what most adults can do. And obviously there's also something with like, um, uh, like their, their limbs are different towards like it, 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 their bodies look different. Babies are fun, but it's also like everything she does in a day, all the moving she does all the things she lifts, moves around, whatever, she does it because it's fun, mm -hmm. because it's interesting, because it occurs to her to do it. And watching that is like, oh, yeah, wow, you're doing those yoga poses that I definitely cannot do and have not been able to do for at least 20 years. Um, and you're doing them just because it's fun to have your head upside down or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and like, and babies are strong. Mm -hmm. Like they are strong. That really yeah. makes me think though, like how we, how, how society sort of drains the joy out of that and like damages our relationship with our bodies in a lot of ways. Yeah. Doesn't it? <laughs> it's so many of us have that kind of like ripped away from us almost mm -hmm. like it somewhere from being a kid to being an adult somewhere along the way this transition happens to where now movement is a chore mm -hmm. yeah and now there are rules right when you're yeah. a kid you do things like you were saying, just because they're fun, because they feel good, because it's yeah. silly, because it makes run around. Laugh. Because why not? <laughs> right. Like my my daughter, um, we have gallons of water in our kitchen and my daughter starts picking them up and just moving them. And I was like, what are you doing? She's like, I don't know. Just, just kept like doing it. it. I was like, OK, <laughs> fair, fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. And if we could just get back to that place, yeah. and this is something I encourage my my clients to do too, is like, it doesn't have to make sense. There doesn't need to be a reason. We just need to like 
focus on what feels good in the moment. Like if you want to go have a dance party by yourself at 2 p.m. in your living room, go do it. The only time it's I'll fine. dance is no one's around. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. It's it's okay. Like that that counts. But society has put these expectations in restrictions around what counts as exercise and what counts as movement and all these things. And it's not true. Like none of that matters. And that's why I do um, this practice with my clients. Actually, my coach a couple of years ago did this with me and I was like, this it changed my perspective on a lot of things. It's called the PQ practice. And so you take a piece of paper digitally or whatever, and you think about what the ultimate version of yourself looks like and not just what they look like, but how do they feel? Mm -hmm. What do they say about themselves? What is their internal monologue, right? Mm -hmm. what, what, are, what are the habits that they have and what are they feeling about those habits? And that can kind of help us pick the habits that actually mean something to us, not just because that we're told they're good for us. For example, it's good to get sunlight, you know, mm -hmm. within the first 30 minutes of waking up, but uh, I wake up at 4 a.m. Sun's not up yet. Yeah. So that doesn't matter to me. Like that doesn't apply to my life. But so many people focus on these habits that don't necessarily apply to them and they feel bad about it because it's like, oh, well, I can't do that. Or like, oh, I'm not interested in that. Habits, exercise, nutrition, all of it is meant to enhance our lives. Mm -hmm. Nobody can tell you what you should be doing. Like, take mm -hmm. a look at what it's actually doing for you and how it's actually making you feel and do that. Yeah. Focus on those things. Don't focus on the long list of things that we're supposed to be doing. I love that. I love that too. I actually <laughs> think that that's like, that is the summation of everything that we've talked about. And it is perfect. <laughs> it is perfect. <laughs> perfect. We no, can't. No, it's, it's no, but it's like, I hope that if, if our listeners take away anything from today's podcast, that right there would be it. It's mm -hmm. my message for everybody. <laughs> An amazing message. Yeah. I love it. Now, is is there anything else that we uh, that we want to talk about before we end today's podcast? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you want to mention, Michaela, or plug? Like, people should definitely um, go follow you. Yeah, we'll promote. Yeah, follow me. <laughs> um, if I could share one thing, yeah, it's a strategy that I teach all of my clients. I use this every single day, and. It is the one thing that I think has helped me the most in getting through those periods of, I can't do this. Like, I, I cannot get myself to start doing it, right? Mm -hmm. I think something that we do in those moments is to think about all of the reasons that we should be doing it, right? Oh, I'm going to feel so much better once I get this done. Mm -hmm. I really want to reach whatever goal. Instead of focusing on those things, I would encourage everybody to just sit with the feeling and ask them why they're having the resistance that they're having, figure out where that resistance is coming from. Is it a sensory issue? Do you hate your workout? Are you tired? Is it just a bad time of day? Like what's going on? And then once you figure that out, you can use the tool, try to lessen the, the pain, right? Try to lessen that, try to make an adjustment. And if you can't, let it go. Lesson release. <laughs> like let's let's move on. Let's find something else that we can that will make us feel good, right? Yeah. Don't take the box off. Just find something else that makes you feel good, right? And it's just kind of trying to release that guilt and figure that's how I help people figure out what works for them is encouraging them to sit with themselves <laughs> and find the resistance. And deal with the resistance. Like, mm -hmm. don't don't shame yourself for having that resistance. Yeah. yeah, figure out the resistance, make the adjustment. That is like the the epitome of everything that I teach right there. <laughs> yes, absolutely. absolutely. Um, I have okay. I have a question. Okay, <laughs> if you were to make your own like wheel of fortune, fun exercise, movement activities, what would be on it? Mm, okay, um, longboarding. 
Um, probably kickboxing. I really like um, hit workouts like calisthenics, but like in the park. Okay. And um, probably dancing. Yeah. Those are some good ones. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Maya? You're like dancing. playing with a toddler. <laughs> <laughs> dancing is it. <laughs> Lifting no, a baby. <laughs> Kara, you know me. Well, I'm, okay, I'll be honest. Um, throwing my baby girl in the air a little bit, like obviously she doesn't go that high, but like throwing her up and catching her, like that and the giggles yeah. that comes out of that. Like the giggles motivate me to do anything. <laughs> um, honestly, hearing a baby or a toddler laugh is like that. That's so the best sounds in the whole world. But when it comes to like what I view as exercise, because that, I mean, it, it totally ties into what we've been talking about because all movement counts, right? But dancing is it. It's the entire list. Um, I used to really enjoy walks, but, um, sometimes walking is, is just too hard. And especially like, I have so many other things that I want to be doing that walking just falls off the list too fast, but dancing always motivates me. Like if there's music involved, I want to do it. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just, I'm simple like that. Yeah. But it also means that I can't get myself to do weightlifting or anything that's too structured, which is not great, (laughs) but salsa, salsa is great. (laughs) I I can't do the, the, I can't do the fast footwork. Sometimes I'll find like belly dancing videos and I'll try to do those (laughs) pretty fun and like empowering, you know? Oh yeah. Awesome. (laughs) No, definitely. Like, but also I, I mean, very often I can't do a lot of the footwork mm-hmm. because my feet right. are the way they are. So a lot of my dancing is tuned down to a level that I can do it. Um, and I focus on just being in the music and mm-hmm. having fun and just, I, I don't know. I just music, 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 music. <laughs> <laughs> it's the whole and list music and adaptations that work for each person like that's such yeah. an important part of yeah i used to do zumba videos yeah. mm. um which because the the dancing format really helps me actually do it yeah um but then i have to put those videos on and the videos are kind of bad <laughs> and <laughs> and i'm like no these are just yeah. It doesn't look good. (laughs) I want to feel sexy. Right. And I want to be silly. Like, I totally want to do like a prancer size, you know, like, I I love being ridiculous. Wait, what would be on yours then? Yeah. I mean, I would look for a lot of things that are non-structured, like certainly walking, hiking, Mm -hmm. maybe dancing, but again, as long as no one's around. Um, but I, yeah, again, I'd be like the Richard Simmons video or a Prancer size video or just something that's really out there and outside of like, I just, I love to learn. I love to see new things. I'd be like, oh, let's see if I can find a Bollywood dance and, you know, just challenge myself to absorb lots of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, I love to swim. So that would probably mm-hmm. be there. But I, I would, I would also like, I'm, I'm just trying to collect ideas because mm. I like to make like little menus of things and be like, what do I feel in the mood for today? And that's, that's how I can usually pick something from a list. Whereas I can't necessarily gen like generate something spontaneously. You right. know what I mean? If I'm left to decide on my own, it, I won't do it. But if right. I'm like, here's my menu of exercises, big and small, like different things I can do. I can usually pick something. You know what, Karen? You actually should have a wheel of fortune of exercises. Now that's what I want to do. That you can go to every day and just be like, (laughs) (laughs) what am I doing? So much fun. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna make something and uh, I'll post it one day. (laughs) Yeah. Do it. Do it. (laughs) Yeah. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to like buy you one. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> there must be like little wheels of fortune that you can buy on like Amazon or something. And like whiteboard ones so that you can change yeah. them. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> That's oh a my good gosh. Idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm inspired. You <laughs> <laughs> should do it. Yeah. All right. Hey, well, well, I know Maya's got to get going. So we'll, yeah, uh, it, it's my kids' bedtime. So I'm, I'm the outlier because I'm in Europe. <laughs> so, um, it is, uh, it is 8 PM now, which oh, means no. that okay. pretty soon my, uh, my, my little daughter is going to be very, very upset if she's not asleep. Same. Well, Michaela, we are so delighted that we could chat with you and, uh, learn so much from you and have some really good belly laughs with you as well. So. <laughs> And thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much for being here and for reminding us to put the fun back in exercise. I love that message and I hope everyone takes it home and remembers it and maybe gets a little wheel of fortune for exercises of their own. <laughs> yeah. Or punch um, cards. And <laughs> I I look forward to you know, someday in a few years, you having put together a, a whole agency of coaches just like you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very exciting. <laughs> and I just want to cool. say thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. And I, I just love being able to connect with others, you know, in this space and just spread that message because it's it's not talked about enough. Mm-hmm. So thank you for even bringing the topic up. <laughs> oh completely our pleasure like what a, what a joy to chat with you and uh, get inspired and now have uh, something on my to-do list to do make a wheel <laughs> <laughs> well, all right that's really great thanks all everyone right. thank you bye <laughs>